So thank you for joining today's Deep Sense Discovery session. We're joined by Andrew Black of the Port of Halifax, and he's going to share some information about the port and how they're using data differently and very much digitizing for the future. I want to note that this is a recorded session. Um, it's a webinar format. There is a chat feature where if you'd like to write some questions, some comments, please feel free. There's a separate Q&A area that I'll monitor and ensure any questions you have are passed over to Andrew. We can open it up afterwards as well for larger questions, but feel free to post your questions in while we're chatting. I'll give a very quick high level overview of DeepSense just to ensure others are aware and understand what it is we are and what we offer. So DeepSense was created in partnership with all of these organizations that you see here with funding from ACOA, the province of Nova Scotia, and also our partners at Cove, Ocean Frontier Institute and Dalhousie University are also big contributors. We have a relationship with IBM as well. We own IBM infrastructure at DeepSense and IBM as a result of our relationship and partnership has also been very generous and donated $12.6 million of in-kind software and support. So I'll get into what that means in a second. But the reason why DeepSense was created is there's a recognition that the ocean sector could really benefit from more advanced analytics from artificial intelligence, machine learning and visualizations. And the reason why we exist is we partner academic researchers with ocean related companies to look at projects that can help those companies either become more efficient, more operationally focused and drive real benefit, or they create some kind of new product or service using AI and machine learning. What we found is a lot of companies may not necessarily know where there is opportunities. Sometimes identifying some of those options with your data is a little tricky. So we try to bring in some skills and expertise because companies might have skills and expertise already, but maybe it's really focused on its current state and current things that need to be delivered. Or maybe they just don't have capacity to explore something new and sometimes getting the software, the infrastructure to do machine learning and AI can be expensive and confusing. So DeepSense comes forward with students and academic researchers we have infrastructure that's on premise that we maintain and it's very secure. So we can help companies explore things with very little investment. We're trying to reduce the return on investment and return on effort for them to see what the potential could be to start using AI and machine learning more often and more frequently in their organization. We have an overall process where we identify some opportunities with companies, we pair them up with researchers, we help them scope out some projects and explore different ways to leverage funding and make sure they have the current data sources in-house or maybe we can find other data sources that are external that can be leveraged for their projects. We also then help those um, companies work with the students, postdocs, PhDs, master students, whomever, to do those projects. And then we deliver uh, that commercial code, proof of concept, some kind of viable solution for the company. And then students often move on to publish papers or maybe a thesis about that topic. And then the real goal is our ecosystem is even bigger and better because we now have companies who are using data differently and we have some great talent who's graduating with an understanding of the ocean sector as a viable career path. So we have two major outcomes from Deep Sense. Our goal is a proof of concept prototype or code for commercialization for a company and some solid skill set that comes out understanding what the tech sector can be. So with that, I'm very excited to say that Andrew is joining us for today's Deep Sense discovery session. So Andrew Black has been with the Port of Halifax and I just looked it up and I totally forget now and that's terrible for a while. Four and a half years. For, I was like, it's, it's like five. I was going to say it was five and then I thought maybe I'm rounding up too much for five years. But Andrew has a great background in helping people understand the business problems and IT and how IT can help solve their business problems. So it's fantastic that he's in this role and has the opportunity to help shape what the port looks like in Halifax. So Andrew, I am going to pass that over to you and look forward to your talk. Great, thanks, Jen. And um, you know, first of all, I'll, I'll start by saying that DeepSense has been a great uh, partner with the Port of Halifax. We're working with them right now on uh, uh, an initiative that's looking at smart buoy data. Uh, really, really great partnership under uh, under the leadership of many, but uh, but especially uh, that that of Jen. So thanks so much for being a good partner, and thank you very much for uh, for. My purpose is to, oh, I'm saying my internet connection is unstable. Can you all still hear me right now? Jen, can you hear me? I lost you for, I lost you for about 15 seconds there. Okay. 
Um, the overall, the uh, internet connection where I am has been pretty good, but uh, today it's had a couple issues. So hopefully that's uh, not a, an ongoing issue. Um, so the purpose of today is to talk to you about some, uh, the way that data is used within the, uh, the industry and talk about some of the developments in the industry that, uh, that, that are, are shaping the use of data. But I wanted to start with just a broad discussion around, uh, around what's happening in the industry uh, beyond uh, data. And, that, and, and so what you see here is four unreasonably large vessels. Uh, these are vessels that are considered what you call ultra-class vessels, uh, which means that they are uh, you know, uh, larger than 10,000 TEUs. In fact, these are all in the sort of 14 to 15,000 TEU uh, class. And that's, uh, that, that's very large. To give you some context, one of these vessels would typically be around 350, maybe 360 meters long, uh, which is three and a half American football fields or three and change Canadian football fields, depending on how you look at it. Um, but these things are really, really big. And, and so when they talk about TEUs, what they're talking about is, uh, is effectively a, 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 um, a 20 foot container box. The average uh, box you see on the back of a, con of a truck going through, uh, going through your city often is a, I would call it a, a 40 foot box, which we would call two TEUs. So the, um, the, 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 these vessels have gotten really large and they've gotten large as a result of industry consolidation and, and cooperation. Uh, to give you some sense for how rapidly they have grown, when I started at the port four and a half years ago, the largest vessel that we had to date was around um, 7,000 7, TEUs. So in, in, in less than five years, they've basically uh, doubled in, in, in size that's, uh, that's calling it the Port of Halifax. And that's where the future is. And so I bring all this up in the, in the context of today's discussion on data for, for a specific reason. It costs, and when you only look at the fixed costs, things like interest on the, uh, on the capital investment, labor, things that you're going to be paying in day in, day out, it costs $50,000 US a day to operate one of these these large vessels, uh, so they're very expensive and uh, to operate. And then when you add in the uh, the the, the non-fixed costs, things like fuel, um, port charges, and port dues, and things like that, um, you can easily get north of a hundred thousand to the tune of one hundred thirty thousand dollars a day to operate these things. So it matters a lot uh, that they be used efficiently. These vessels come to Halifax as part of an East, uh, East Coast swing. And they come via Asia, by the, or from Asia via the Suez Canal across the Atlantic Ocean, and they uh, typically then go down the Eastern seaboard. All of them will call it New York. Our job as the port of Halifax, which in comparison to the port of New York is relatively small, our job is to make our port as attractive as possible so that as many of them as, po uh, so that as many of these come and drop off 12% of their cargo as, as, as we can make happen. We want to be part of what they call a string, part of a, a regularly scheduled trip. And so you can be that if you are known to be a very reliable port. Uh, but if you're not known to be a reliable port, people won't do business with you, especially if you were that stop right before New York, because if people need to make their time slot in New York and if they miss their, their birth window, they may face steep fines. So it really does matter. Uh, you know, reliability matters to any port. It matters to the port of Halifax uh, more, more than most in North America. Um, so that's all just a bit of context on, on some things happening in the industry. Um, so with all that said, the purpose of today, uh, today's discovery session is, is to talk to you a bit about what the port of Halifax has done uh, in, in our efforts to be a data-driven port. What are some of the big undertakings that we've done? Uh, what are some of the challenges that we continue to encounter? Where are we going uh, next in some of our, uh, some of our planning? Um, thank you again to DeepSense for the invite into Jen. Uh, this, is, uh, this is great. We always enjoy talking about some of the initiatives that we've uh, been involved with. And uh, I hope that uh, everyone who's joining us today finds this to be a, uh, an informative, uh, informative discussion. So let me start with just a bit about the Port of Halifax. Uh, Port Halifax uh, generates about $2 billion a year in, uh, in economic, um, economic, oh, shoot, I went too far ahead, uh, economic development activity in, uh, in the province. Um, and that uh, results in, in, in somewhere in the neighborhood of 15,000 jobs. So a major economic uh, contributor in the, uh, in the province. It says that, you know, there that the, the, the many of the largest shipping lines 
call it Port Halifax, uh, and, and that, that is true. We get uh, most of the largest shipping lines in the world call, call here. Uh, we focus across three lines of business. Uh, today is gonna, kind of, so cargo, cruise, and real estate. Today I will speak more about the cargo side, uh, in, in part because it's a bit more data rich, at least as it applies to, to, uh, to a Port Authority side. Um, I also just wanted to spend a small amount of time speaking about what a Port Authority is and how it fits into a broader port. Um, the Port, port Authority is the sort of the, the, the legal entity that oversees the, uh, um, the, the operations of a port, uh, or at least the, or the, the running of a port. Um, but that is a bit misleading in the sense that uh, you know, we have tenants, we have terminal operators, for example, who actually deal directly with the shipping lines and, uh, and, and, and who have uh, you know, uh, rail lines on their property that pull cargo out of their terminals and things like that. What a port authority is though, is a hub with many spokes. Uh, and, and we are responsible for, for making all these different things uh, work well together. Uh, you know, when, when, when something that bad happens in a, in a port, it's the port authority that typically gets the phone call. It's our job to make sure these things all work well together. And the increasing importance of data has introduced new opportunities for port authorities to, uh, to be uh, helping uh, the, in, ensure the fluidity and, and, and proper functions of, uh, of, of ports. So I want to speak a bit about this, and, and this is really speaking to uh, uh, digital maturity. Um, and, and this is bored from uh, folks at the Port of Rotterdam. If you want to see some of the really interesting global ports, they, they aren't in North America. The really interesting uh, global ports uh, are, are, you know, the Port of Rotterdam, Port of Singapore. They're, they're ones who are, who are class leaders in this stuff. Um, and they published a white paper on digital maturity. Um, and, and, and so this, this, this first uh, icon that you see on the, uh, on the far left speaks to a port that has limited digital connectivity. Um, you might be surprised at the number of processes that today are supported by fax, email, phone calls, things like that. Uh, things that are inherently uh, you know, limited in terms of who, who the information reaches, uh, they are reliant on someone to be able to, you know, sort of either pick up the phone or respond to the email. They're, 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 there's inherent data problems with them. Um, I mean, fax machines um, are, you know, it's, a, it, it's surprising to me that people still use fax machines. It means that at least two people have still have fax machines, uh, but yet uh, they continue to uh, to support some important processes in uh, in, in in many in many ports. That middle icon speaks to a port that is more digitally enabled, more connected at the local level. And, uh, and that is what we really strive to be as a, uh, as, as a port, um, except that it's not sufficient for us to be uh, connected at the local level. It's, 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 it's crucial. Uh, but in addition to us being connected at the, uh, the local level, uh, we need to understand that our role is to be a connected, digitalized uh, uh, local port that is part of a broader global supply chain that is also heavily digitized. So, um, so, so when we think about maturity, our intention is to be a bit of, a bit of column B and a little bit of column C, uh, you know, to, to make sure that what we are is, 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 is performing our role within the supply chain. This is a really interesting image. Um, it came from what was at the time called global trade digitization, what today is called trade lens. And I'll speak more of that in a moment. Um, but it speaks to the, the current state versus the future state. Um, what you see on the, on the today part of the slide, the left part of the slide, is this, uh, the, it, this information flow that is really what you would call node to node. It's either operator to operator or, or regulator to operator. Um, and it, it, it's inherently uh, challenging for a few different reasons. One is that it assumes that the right uh, operator or, or you know, private partner is, is, is reaching the right authority with the right information, which sometimes happens and sometimes does not. Um, it also assumes that you're always looking at the right version of the truth. And as a practical matter, some of the tools I mentioned uh, you know, a minute ago are the tools that, 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 that tend to support these, uh, uh, this information flow. E emails are especially, uh, especially challenging. And if you, uh, you know, a, a, a typical vessel uh, can result in dozens of uh, dozens of emails sending back, uh, sent back and forth, and uh, let alone an individual container, which in certain instances can result in many many different emails passed back and forth. And so then you compare that to what you see on the right side of the, the future state. 
the idea that you're going to have um, global platforms where you access what you should be seeing on a permission basis uh, so that you have visibility into the supply chain and you have an understanding of what, what value it is to you. Um, in our view, uh, that future state is, is, is really exciting. And uh, we've been working with the Trade Lens platform since they announced that they were going to, uh, to, 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 to start this. We were one of the initial signatories when, uh, when, when this was announced. So Trade Lens is a partnership between IBM and Maersk uh, to, to basically have a blockchain powered platform that, uh, that provides information uh, to, uh, to, to, to the different party, par parties in the, uh, involved in shipping, of which there are many. And you see uh, a pretty rich sample here of, uh, of some of the examples of, of what they are. There's more than that. Uh, but as a practical matter, as we try, uh, try and understand the, um, uh, the, the, the relative importance in, in, in in trade, uh, you know, the, the, the idea of having a global and central and authoritative platform where you're looking at one version of the truth, that is very attractive to everyone in the supply chain. And it's so far from what exists today that, uh, that we, you know, we generally hope that this exists. It requires a few things um, uh, and, and, it, and it continues, the Trade Lens platform continues to be in beta, uh, but we are, are, are hopeful that it will, uh, will succeed and they're working on some things like the, global data standards and things like that. So uh, a really important uh, under, uh, initiative. Uh, there are others who will compete with IBM and Maersk. Uh, there's one that's coming out of China uh, called the Global Shipping Business Network. Um, our view is not that we necessarily need to work exclusively with one, but rather that by working with one, we'll learn to work with all of them. Uh, but that this is, uh, is, is pivotal, a pivotal importance to the flow of information and the exchange of data. So I want to speak a bit about um, what uh, our commitment to data transparency has been and, and how that fits into being a, a data-driven port. Uh, and there's been a few different things. And I'll, I'll start by speaking to the, uh, to the Port Operations Centre, which is an initiative that we kicked off a couple of years ago. Um, due to some, uh, some technical challenges at my end, I'm actually going to stop sharing for a moment and I'm going to switch over to, uh, to Jen. And Jen is going to let me take over her screen. So. Um, I am viewing Jennifer's screen. Great. So Jen, I've just requested remote control. Okay. So what you see here is the Port Operations Center, which is part of the, uh, the website, uh, portofhalifax.ca. Um, what you see at the top here is just a registration piece. I'll skip past that because it's not really of, of crit critical importance. We launched the Port Operations Center, um, it's actually, I guess, closer to three years ago. It's uh, uh, in the June of, of 2017 was when we first launched the, uh, the Port Operations Center with a vision to be a single place where local and global members of the Port Authority could, or the Port community, excuse me, could find current and operational information. Um, and so this became that single gathering place, that, 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 uh, our attempt at creating an authoritative place for, for, for information about our, our, our gateway. Uh, and so there's a bunch of different things. Now I'll spend a bit of time just talking you through what these different tools are and why they're, why they're important to, uh, um, uh, to, to, to our partners in the port community. This really exemplifies this idea of the, uh, the hub and spoke. Uh, the port authority here is acting as that, 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 that hub of information. Uh, because we have many different parties who, uh, who, who rely on us to, uh, to ensure fluid operations. So the first thing you see up here is special alerts. Um, and, uh, and, and the special alerts are used for any exceptions to regular working procedures. Uh, so this can be things like updates about the, uh, um, uh, the, the, the coronavirus and COVID-19. Uh, more commonly, uh, you would see this as, you know, for example, if there's road construction that might be impacting one of the arteries to and from our terminals, or you would see it as a, um, uh, an update if there's uh, inclement weather that's preventing our pilots from boarding vessels and therefore they're unable to bring things to birth. Uh, we use this quite regularly just to provide updates uh, to anyone who's, who's interested. It's both published here and people can receive it by, by email or SMS uh, text. Um, below that, we get into some of the, uh, the, the metrics that we look at, including some, some KPIs. And so we have two KPIs that we've negotiated with um, our terminals and with our, our rail provider. 
Um, if you don't know, um, Halifax has a single rail uh, partner, which is a CN rail. So we have one, one line in and out, uh, or one rail partner in and out of, uh, out of Halifax. And so we have two different uh, KPIs. We want to have 9% of our, our, our uh, containers off our terminals within 72 hours. And we want to have 100% um, off our terminals within 96 hours. Um, I, I just as a point of reference, first of all, we, we're, we're pretty close to our, our, our KPIs right now, which is great. Um, Halifax is known to be a very reliable port. And, and so we're, um, you know, the, while, while there can be some exceptions, the numbers aren't always quite this good. Overall, our numbers are very strong. And so we're, 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 we're happy to speak to them. Uh, and it's really important that the data be available there, uh, warts and all, so that when things are bad, people can see, yeah, okay, that was not as good a week, and they can ask tough questions. And that's uh, that's an important part of being a, a data-driven board is to uh, put the information out there, even if you don't like what it's, uh, what the story that's telling you. Um, next to that, you see days on dock, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's uh, the amount of time the container spends spends on dock. And then next to that, you see this thing called terminal gate metrics. and um, what I'll do is just uh, actually open this up in a, uh, you know what, that's going to force me to open a new page, I think. Yeah, well, uh, so I'll do that quickly and then we'll um, come back to the, uh, to the main page in a second. So the terminal gate metrics were, uh, were launched about a year and a half ago, uh, maybe closer to two. Uh, and the idea was to provide some mix of um, current and historical information on, on performance at our, at our terminal gates as it applies to trucks. So what you have at the top of the screen here is um, the, uh, the information of our gate wait time. So the time that a truck spends waiting in the queue uh, to get into a terminal and then the time that it takes to get a truck from inbound gate to outbound gate. So you have this broken down by container terminal in Halifax we have two container terminals uh, so that you have ultimate visibility on uh, performance at, at both places. In addition to that, we provide a breakdown of what we call recent historic data. So, um, so you have you know, today's column on the right, and then you have the last five business days. Using a really simple color coding, green means good, uh, yellow means less good, uh, red means that, uh, that, that there's been some, some problems that are atypical. And overall, what you see is that uh, you know, in most weeks, Halifax looks a lot like this. There's generally some uh, uh, a, a lot of green, uh, it, to the extent that there is a bit of yellow and red, it usually either it finds itself on either side of uh, the opening of, uh, of a terminal, either at, after the lunch hour or, um, or at the beginning of the day. Um, and so that, uh, that tool has been very helpful for our trucking partners so they can understand, um, okay, well, if I, uh, instead of the, you can go back and get uh, year to date stats and things like that. It helps our trucking partners understand, okay, well, if I'm going to be showing up at, uh, at 8 a.m., this is this is the stuff that I should expect, and this is uh, the sort of uh, so some of the delays. It helps them make their own data-driven decisions, which is what we really want. You know, the port authority can't tell people when to, uh, it doesn't tell people to when to come, uh, but nonetheless, we give them uh, power to make decisions that will uh, uh, support a uh, more uh, efficient and fluid port. Um, this. Uh, this I can open a new tab and I'll, uh, I'll put this out. This was an extension of our, our uh, terminal, uh, the terminal gate metrics to extend that so that people could um, understand uh, the fluidity as it applied to um, our, you know, the main arteries in our, uh, in our city. And so th this looks at this by terminal. So we can see over here, we're looking at Fairview Cove and then on the, on the right side, we're looking at the South End. You can do this by inbound or outbound traffic. Um, and, and again, using that same, uh, that same green means good, yellow means less good, and red means there's a bit of a problem. But you get from this a, a quick snapshot of, um, of, of the overall fluidity as it applies to, uh, to, to our uh, accessing our downtown container, or both of our container terminals. Uh, this will become even more important as we get into projects like the Cogswell redevelopment and, uh, and the, uh, the Windsor Street Exchange project, um, because this data will be, you know, we have uh, installed some additional readers that'll help us understand with a higher degree of granularity where, where bottlenecks might be occurring. Uh, so again, this is part of that broader uh, idea of our, our role as a provisioner of data to make sure that we're keeping an eye on things. And in this case, it's, it's, it's you know, our, our intention is to, 
um, identify problems before they, uh, you know, before they're rampant problems, to so, uh, identify things very early and, and, and quickly. You see over here, um, arrivals and de departures and tides. This is uh, a data feed that actually comes from the Atlantic Pilotage Authority. Um, for those who may not understand what a role a pilot is in, in, in a port, when a, uh, when a vessel arrives in Halifax, they actually get boarded out by the pilot station, which is outside the harbor, um, by a pilot uh, who then takes control of the vessel and brings it into the berth. Basically, someone who knows the, uh, the local waters. And, uh, and so this information, um, uh, and, and there's an expanded view of this that I won't get into right now, but uh, this information um, uh, gives you an idea of, okay, well, what are the tentative schedules? When are things firmed up at the uh, at the port? Things like uh, things of that sort. Um, going a bit further down, um, you know, container tracking. Uh, people can understand from from this tool um, where a container is from the moment that it gets off a vessel in Halifax uh, to either the point that it leaves by truck gate or uh, or in the event uh, that it leaves by rail, which most of our containers leave roughly around seventy percent of our containers are are, are leaving by rail. Uh, to the point that it leaves the uh, the CN Rail network, which uh, which reaches deep into the to, to the US. So it's a great tool for providing that visibility for uh, for for our partners, uh, you know, for retailers, for for people who are are moving goods through the port of Halifax. Um, there's a couple other tools I'll skip past uh, because there are a lot, and I don't want to take up too much time here. This one's really neat, though. Uh, this is a relatively uh, uh, new uh, tool that we added to. Um, to the Port Operations Center called the Vessel Forecast Summary. One of the um, somewhat surprising gaps in, uh, in, in, in global visibility is that uh, things have been reliant on, on AIS transponders and beacons um, to, uh, and, and if you don't know what AIS is, it's, it's, it's you know, you have an AIS beacon installed on, on the vast majority of vessels, um, and it's a way of, of, of tracking uh, vessel movements. But it only works when it's in sufficient proximity to the beacon. Uh, and, uh, and, and so they're, you know, for vessels that are going across the, uh, the Atlantic before they arrive at the port, um, it meant that we would only gain uh, visibility on a vessel fairly late in the game. So one of the game changers around this is uh, um, satellite-based AIS, uh, satellite-based AIS tracking. And, uh, and that has uh, allowed us to, uh, to, to, to get greater visibility. Now this particular tool, this is working with a, 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 a Copenhagen-based startup uh, called EC. Um, this particular uh, tool takes not only satellite-based AIS data, but also later on top of it, uh, known, known events around the world. They're constantly monitoring for uh, things like weather events, things that, uh, that, that, you know, whether or not there's delays at a port or a strike at, uh, at a different terminal that, uh, that that vessel is supposed to call at, uh, any number of different things to provide a, um, uh, a more accurate uh, forecast. And, and, and so what you see here is uh, you have the, uh, the pro forma ETA, what, what the shipping lines said uh, was going to happen way back when they signed the contract with the retailer. Um, then it's actual ETA, but based on the, uh, the better data that we have, and then the deviation that, uh, that we're seeing from, from that. And so you see that on a number of, uh, a number of different uh, uh, things. Again, red means, uh, red means bad, green means good, um, yellow means slight delays. We don't have any examples of yellow here right now, but uh, generally green means, uh, green means all on time. Um, so that gives you a quick overview of, um, of that. And Jen, uh, Jen, I think what I'll do is switch back over to my, uh, my PowerPoint deck at this time. Okay, so I will, oh, here we go. So um, I mentioned this idea of, um, uh, yeah, the, the, the idea of the Port Operations Center. Again, it's, it's, it's now uh, approaching three years old. It's, you know, some of the tools that you've seen in there are, 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 have been introduced within the last year. So it's been an ongoing project, but nonetheless, um, you know, we're, we're in the data world. So two and a half years ago uh, or three years ago feels like an eternity. Um, so what next? And, and, and that's a really good question to, uh, to, 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 to focus on. Um, we have, for the time being, said, you know, we're going to continue to this idea that we're going to 
be a hub for the uh, for the port. And, uh, and, and, and so one of the areas of focus is on, on predictive capabilities. And so this slide gives, paints a bit of a picture of uh, how we work with, um, you know, how we can work with our different partners. Now, uh, a lot of different people require information um, in order for a port to be running efficiently and fluidly. Uh, so that includes some of the people you've heard me mention uh, already. So that includes our, our, our terminal operators, it includes our pilots, our tugs, uh, includes uh, labor. We need to have the right skills available on the right day. Um, it also includes our, our, you know, we see out here the uh, the ground carriers. And that means both uh, both truckers and uh, and rail. Um, and so rail is an especially complex one because uh, you know if if we find out that we're going to be so many feet of rail short, and we only find that out a day in advance, that's not time enough for 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 CN to be moving. Uh, a greater number of rail cars uh, into our into our gateway in time to, to to make an adjustment, right? So, the idea is that if we can get to a point where uh, we're we're providing greater um, visibility well in advance, that, uh, that 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 our partners can make more data driven decisions to uh, to ensure that they have the uh, the goods that they need when when they need them. Um, this idea of having a single authoritative version of the truth is really important. I'll, I'll give an example of that in a uh, in a minute or two. Uh, but overall, the idea that the port can be a, a data hub for, for, for the port community and that we can provide information that's useful to our partners is, 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 is considered to be uh, one of the functions that, uh, that we view as a port. This is one of these things that is a bit ambiguous in the sense that uh, um, data is, is, is understood, um, uh, you know, the value of data is understood um, today in a way that's much greater than when the uh, Canada Marine Act was drafted uh, or, or revised back in 1999. Uh, so to some extent, um, you know, we're, we're playing a role that's relatively new to port, uh, but nonetheless consistent with the idea that we are that uh, the hub with many spokes. So um, I want to speak a bit, um, and, and, and I'll be wrapping up fairly in the next few minutes here. So, uh, but I do want to speak a bit to, uh, to, to some of the challenges that we run into. Um, the first one um, is, is one that, uh, that you will get used to in a, if you find yourself in a life of being a data practitioner, uh, the, the quality of the data that you receive is not always great. I mean, first of all, if, if people are, are, are sending information that you would like to have visibility on, but they're sending it by fax, then you can take a guess at how much data you're receiving from that. But overall, the, uh, the, the, the data quality is, is sent at inconsistent time intervals, uh, it's a sense of varying degrees of quality. And so there's things like, you know, there's a numerical code, it's called an HS code that tells you what each, each good is that's being shipped through a port. Um, and, uh, and, and, and so someone might um, describe a, a white woman's blouse as um, 684231, um, whereas actually someone else would say it's 32. You know, there's just a bunch of different discrepancies and some of them are at the very practical level. As a practical matter for us, it means that uh, that's challenging to get data that's of, of sufficient quality. Some of the things that we're looking at to alleviate that is, you know, can we utilize natural language processing, for example, to uh, to help us uh, address some of those uh, those data quality issues. The other, the next one that you see noted there is um, is changing behaviors. Um, and gosh, that one should be easier to solve, um, but uh, but as a practical matter, um, you know. Uh, we can get everything right from uh, an information flow standpoint and still have people uh, either uh, challenging that or, uh, or, or, or um, uh, you know, having publishing information at different intervals and things like that. Uh, an example I'll give um, is, is that we have three different websites for publishing some version of a, um, of, of, of a vessel forecast summary. Now, only one of those is, is, is our website. And, and the other people aren't doing anything wrong by publishing that, but nonetheless, uh, it's confusing for people if you're asking them to make data-driven decisions. It's confusing if they don't know which data is most authoritative. Um, getting people to get on board with a digital mindset is, is, is challenging. And, uh, and to do things like entering things into a web portal instead of picking up the phone. Um, that is, again, it's challenging, but it's important in, uh, in the flow of information. Um, the last thing is as much a challenge as is, is an opportunity. Um, Collaborative decision making is really interesting. Now, there's the sort of small scale collaborative decision making that, that you do in, in, in 
you know, as a vessel is coming into port, you need to be collaborating with your partners to make sure that you have the right labor there, that you make sure that they have, the, you know, the, 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 the space they expect to have on the berth is theirs, to make sure that you have the cranes lined up and to make sure that everything happens. So that's one small scale version of it. Some of the other bigger ideas though that we uh, are, are, are looking at within this is, um, is the idea that when ports make decisions about things like infrastructure, they tend to be, uh, they tend to be large investments. Um, they tend to often be, you know, to, to, to do a major overhaul of a container terminal yard, you might be looking at a nine digit investment to do that and to build a new term container terminal, you're, you're generally going to be looking at more than a billion. Um, and, uh, using some publicly available figures, you know, the temporary extension that we have of our South End Container Terminal, which allows us to berth two of those enormous vessels I showed at the start concurrently, uh, that, uh, that temporary extension is a $35 million investment. That's our, that's our, our temporary extension. Uh, you know, it's so um, another one is, you know, we looked at that rail solution, uh, a rail solution that would take trucks off our downtown roads. Um, that is in the neighborhood of, uh, of $100 million to, to, to implement that. So, the point I make is that we, we you know, we don't throw, we, we tend to make, make meaningful investments. And often what, what the status quo is, is that we're making decisions without, um, it's not that we're not consulting with our partners, we are, but we're, uh, but everyone's consulting with their own data sets and, and looking at it in their own platforms, even though uh, we might have um, different uh, data sets that will help us uh, make a richer and better informed decision if we were to tap into everyone's information. So one of the things we're, we're looking at right now is, is, is um, having a platform that can take disparate data, uh, uh, disparate data models and that were never intended to speak to one another and to bring together in a single, uh, single place so that we can more fully understand and, and work with our partners to define, okay, well, if we make this decision to move this here, that's going to have that impact on traffic in this new location, um, but it will improve things over here. And just so we can make decisions with a better, you know, a, a better and richer understanding of, of, of the full implication. So that is especially important if you're an urban port. Um, you know, urban stakeholders are becoming very vocal and, and understandably so because people care a great deal about the, uh, the quality of life in the city that they reside in. And so, uh, you know, this is something that is especially important for urban ports. It's also important because we're all conscious of uh, the impact of climate change and we want to make sure that we have uh, uh, taken into account environmental factors and sustainability factors that we um, uh, that others may have better data sets to support. Uh, so that is the end of my prepared presentation um, and uh, maybe I'll stop sharing at this point in time and uh, um, Jen I'm, I'm, I'm happy to uh, to take questions as uh, as people uh, do appropriate but thanks I, I, I thank you again for the opportunity and uh, and I hope that was informative. That was fantastic. And please feel free either. Um, I can unmute people if you'd like, but uh, sometimes sound doesn't always work for everyone and it's a bit of a struggle. So there is a Q&A area if you'd like to submit some questions. We also have a comment section as well. But I think that's been really helpful. I think one of the things that, you know, you touched on a lot of the same key messages at Deep Sense that we try to convey, things around data quality and consistency. And before we started this talk, we had earlier discussions around even just naming conventions for files and file shares and, and how tricky that is. What do you think has been one of the biggest challenges to get all of that data? You just showed, I can only imagine how much background data that went into that dashboard alone. What were probably a couple of the biggest hurdles that you faced with that data? So you wanted a single point of truth for certain things and you want to make data available. So was the biggest challenge trying to find the data and get the right version, trying to get people on side with the version that you do show, trying to make sure you even have the right names for the data in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, some of what, some of the data that you saw uh, presented there is, you know, is, is on, um, you know, is, is looking at the operations of our terminal. And I mentioned earlier that we, we effectively are a landlord. Uh, we're a landlord with a mandate, but you know, we, we don't operate the terminals ourselves. So one of the first challenges we ran into was a very human challenge of just making sure that our partners were on board with, uh, with us publishing this data. Um, that, what, that port operations center is, is more than, um, than, than, than any other, you know, within the North American uh, lens, uh, we're, we're, we're more active on this than, uh, than anyone else is. And, and, and it, because reliability matters so much to us, 
And so there was a, a meaningful effort on, on just a sales pitch to say, this is why this is important to, to, our, to our business growth. And, it, uh, and yeah, there's going to be days where people hold our feet to the fire. And that's, that's ultimately a good thing. So part of it was just a very human challenge around that. But then as we got into the data sets, you know, some of the things that we introduced, um, there were different versions of the same data. Um, and, uh, or, or at least, yeah, different pieces of data that t told the same story. Um, so an example I'll give is uh, terminal gate metrics. Um, you know, uh, one of our terminals had their own data on this stuff and we need to make sure that our, our, our data aligned. For our purposes, we were actually using, um, uh, we were picking up uh, truck transponder, uh, uh, sorry, Mac pass transponders for trucks. Uh, only tracking container trucks uh, that called at our terminals, but um, you know that, that meant that we were going to be you know using something. Not every truck has a, a Mac pass transponder. Most of them do. Ninety-five percent of them do. We found that out from Halifax Harbor Bridges. But uh, once we found out that it was ninety-five, we we determined okay, well that's enough. Um, assuming that we have a good read rate, that's going to be enough for uh, for us to be able to credibly tell a story of what's what's going on, even if we're not capturing every truck. Uh, and so there was some work on that late in that project to make sure that the data, you know, to, if there's any data discrepancies, we need to figure out why and to, uh, to take corrective uh, measures to make sure that what we had um, was, uh, was telling a, a story that was helpful and that was not being unfair to either terminal and things like that. So there's a bunch of different challenges within that um, that, uh, that, that, that we dealt with. Um, gosh, I could, I could go on for, for a while on that one, but I'll, I'll stop. <laughs> I think this is kind of the... Um... The, the world of as you try to bring data together and try to bring stakeholders together. And it's kind of maybe for any IT project management experience is kind of some similar challenges. So one of the questions we do have um, is from Donald and he's saying, has there been any discussion around adding environmental performance data such as underwater noise? Um, yeah, uh, so um, gosh, uh, my, uh, our, our manager, uh, Chris, uh, uh, who oversees all, of, all, all our environmental program um, would, would love that question. Um, yeah, there's a bunch of different things that we're looking at in, uh, on the environmental side and, and some of which um, in some areas we, our, our data is a bit more uh, developed uh, and in some it's, it's less. Um, it's, so not just underwater noise, but that has, is one of the things that's been looked at. Uh, we have a, um, um, a, 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 a semi-annual, I believe it is, performing, uh, performance metric that we need to look at, or a, not a performance metric, but a, um, a standard that we need to meet and measure ourselves against just so we have an idea of, uh, of how we're performing and that uh, underwater noise, uh, to my recollection, is one of the uh, areas of, of focus and is one that we've spoken to local suppliers about in the not too distant past. Um, so yeah, absolutely, underwater noise matters. It, it matters more for some other, you know, if, if you are the, you know, uh, one of the ports along the St. Lawrence, um, where right whales has been an issue. Um, it's, 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 it's a greater issue there. Um, you know, we uh, don't have that, that, that same complexity, but nonetheless, it's, it's one of the metrics that we're asked to look at and, and, and therefore we do. I think it's a, it's a really good question too, because I know there's been some discussion of this in other ports that I've heard about, and there's been some rules around speeds and noise volumes. So sometimes vessels will slow down until they pass the area where the data is collected and then make noise again. So I think there's, it's really tricky trying to figure out what the end objective is and trying to ensure we have the right behavior coming out of it and aren't just workarounds. Yeah. We have another question uh, from another Andrew, because there's only just a couple of you in the world. Um, Andrew said this is very inf interesting information. Thank you. He's curious about the global platform you described about the IBM Maersk relationship. So what's the business model? Is it subscription based? Is it per transaction? Yeah, so really good question. Um, it, it is subscription based. Um, the idea is that uh, you will have um, different parties who will be what's called network members, people who are contributing data to the platform. Um, and um, so that will include things like, you know, a CN would be a network member, um, you know, Canada Board Services Agency because they uh, provide container releases and things like that. Or, um, you know, terminal operators. Uh, there's some genuine discussion on what, whether which side of the equation port authorities fall fit into. Um, but we we think right now that we're going to be a network member, but we're we're, we're discussing with Trade Lens about that. Um, but there is also a subscription side to this, where uh, where we're 
subscribing to, uh, to, to, to you can subscribe to receive data. Now, more typically, that would be for, um, you know, sort of uh, third party uh, logistics providers. Um, so, so, you know, you know, agents, freight forwarders and things like that. Uh, those, that that's where Trade Lens expects to make its, uh, its revenue from. Um, I can't speak to the business model for, uh, for the global shipping business, business network, which is the, the Chinese one. Um, um, so I, I just, I, I haven't, I haven't, uh, seen enough about that. They're a bit further behind in their, uh, uh, in their development on that one. So, uh, so trade lens is, it kind of has a more developed version, but, um, you know, for, for, for what we've seen, it does look like it's going to be a uh, subscription based. Great. And we have another question from Deepan who says, how do you think that AI would make your jobs easier and what kinds of predictions would be possible? Yeah, good question. Um, so there's a lot of different ways that, uh, that AI can, uh, uh, can help. Um, the, 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 <laughs> Sorry, apparently I forgot how to speak English at the uh, 40 minute mark. Um, it's so broad, I think, is the, yeah, your answers yeah, here. Uh, and there really are a lot of different, uh, different tools that can be, uh, can be put to use. Uh, you know, and sometimes AI ends up being the wrong tool. Um, uh, you know, that, that's a forecast summary that we showed earlier. Uh, some of our colleagues in uh, some of our other Canadian ports, we collaborate quite frequently with, uh, with our uh, fellow container ports, they looked at utilizing AI to provide similar value and they ultimately decided this doesn't work. They did a, a, a pilot and they said, no, no, that's, that, this is the wrong tool to, uh, to answer that question. Um, but I do think that uh, there's some, you know, I mentioned earlier that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm looking at things like the quality of data that you receive, uh, the ability of natural language processing to, uh, to, to assist in the improvement of uh, data, just recognizing because often what happens is, is it's the same error that's repeated over and over again or a slight variation on the same error that's repeated over and over again. So once you can recognize, okay, well, that person who wrote this in, um, they incorrectly coded this as X, Y, Z, and therefore we should always recognize that in fact, that's ABC. So there's a bunch of different things. Um, I do think you can make a lot of progress on, on, on that. Um, I do think that there's some, uh, some areas around, uh, uh, for example, uh, you know, optical character recognition where um, where that can help, uh, where AI can, can be a useful tool or, or for that matter, even, um, uh, something as simple as just understanding, um, if you have a camera on a road, are you, is the thing that just drove past you a, um, a container truck, an empty container truck, a Dodge pickup, a bicycle, uh, or a scooter, right? Like just to be able to understand uh, and recognize those different things. I, I think some of the examples I gave, there were probably more machine learning than AI, but Overall, uh, you get a sense for some of the different applications. People could go on for for, for um, you know two hours on a, on a richer answer on that one. There's there's a lot of different areas that are being explored in the industry right now. Thank you. I I think one of the questions that I try to ask whenever we have these talks is the focus for students. So part of our job at DeepSense is to help companies and organizations like the Port of Halifax and all of your partners see where there's potential in projects and using data differently. But then part of it is helping students understand what are their career potentials and what should they think about as they're trying to get a job in the ocean sector. So when you think about a student who's about to graduate, what are the things that you think that you might look for? So let's say you were hiring someone to work with you right now to work on data and figuring out what the future of the data could be at the port or trying to advance some of your initiatives. What are you looking for? Yeah, okay, really, really good question. A um, couple things. First of all, um, you know, I, I personally, I would look at um, a lot of academic performance um, and then a lot of what else has nothing to do with their academic performance. So if you look at the resume of someone like a Jen LaPlante, it's full of different community groups that she's been involved with um, and, and different things. And it's, uh, it's all about problem solving. And, 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 and in, in your schooling and in the work that you'll do, you're going to learn how to do the technical problem solving. But a lot of the, the problems that you find yourself solving in this data stuff is not actually um, uh, technical problems to solve. A lot of this is either personal challenges uh, or you know, interpersonal challenges, I should say or it's, it's, it's things around like, you know, defining a naming convention and just different things like that. So I look for people who are 
really involved in a variety of things. Uh, you know, for me, that's been some combination of, um, you know, when I was younger, it was student politics, and then uh, I spent a bit of time dabbling unsuccessfully in partisan politics. Uh, but it's also, you know, you know, involved in community groups and different boards of different things, uh, stuff that just trains your brain how to think um, and, and, and think through critical thinking. Uh, you know, to me, if you're getting that person who can really bring the technical skills and really bring the, uh, the ability to, uh, to take a, um, something that might be a tough sell and drag it to the finish line, uh, that, that person's going to be really, really valuable and, and will have the easiest job uh, seeing career growth uh, opportunities, uh, you know, it, it's um, it's not the 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 the, the interpersonal problem solving is a, is is especially important. So. I completely hands down agree with that one. Now, um, I just want to put this out in case anyone else has any other questions, um, but maybe um, one last one, I guess, is, is kind of reinforcing that. I guess um, sometimes when you're a port you don't always own and operate all of your data. So one last question, where, do, where does your data sit? And is some of your data just a feed coming from else, someone else's server somewhere? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, in fact, most of the data that's out there is not, uh, most of the interesting data that's out there that is not ours. Uh, and so uh, we have decided that as an organization, we, we think it's important that we be that uh, single place of, of truth. But to give you some sense, I mean, like, like, you know, things like our container tracking tool, in order to do that, we require data from our, uh, from our terminal operators and data from CN, uh, you know, they, and if we don't bring those two things together, then you have a less valuable tool. And, and so there's a bunch of different things like that where, where we are required to, uh, to, 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 uh, to work with different parties to, uh, for, for, for them to provide things. Um, overall, uh, as it applies to, um, us as a port, we, we generally, you know, to the extent that we have data, we want it um, uh, to be um, uh, cloud-based. Um, ideally, you know, what, what Trade Lens effectively is, is, is data as a service. It's basically a large platform that's providing us with a, um, you know, a fire hose full of data uh, to, 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 to work with so we can look at that and, and understand things. In an ideal world, we find more, more things like that. But in addition to that, we have things like this, you know, the smart buoy project that we're working on with, with, with DeepSense where, um, you know, uh, we're, we're looking at something that, you know, it, it's very different from, from that trade lens model. It's, it's, it's something where we're working in partnership with uh, uh, local innovators to, uh, to help define something. That particular instance, the data, again, doesn't reside on our servers. Not, we're, we're fine with that. It's, you know, maintaining servers is not a core uh, uh, core function of, of being a port authority. So to the extent that we can get other experts looking at that, we're, we're happy. Um, I, I might just say, Jen, there's a variation on the AI question that I see in the chat um, that I just want to speak to briefly um, because I, uh, my, my, my answer on AI didn't, didn't give a good answer on that. Um, and so um, just how, around how do you think AI would make the jobs easier, make the kinds of prediction possible? Uh, that is a really interesting one, and 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 let me give you an example of uh, of what that might look like. So I, I mentioned this this idea that you have uh, a vessel coming across the uh, the, the the Atlantic Ocean. It's uh, it's going to call in Halifax first, and then it's going to go down to New York, and then down it might go down to, to to Savannah or wherever. It goes down the Eastern Seaboard to other places that can berth ultra class vessels. What also happens is you have vessels that come up the other way. And, uh, and so, whereas we might, as a result of our vessel forecast tool, have 28 days visibility on a vessel uh, that's coming across, really the extent to which we have a relevant metric for a vessel that is coming from New York, you know, you basically have two days worth of visibility. Um, and so that, is, that makes the, you know, if, you, if, if you're trying to accurately uh, provide, um, you know, useful information to CN about rail car requirements, that is going to require something to fill in the gap. Uh, you know, so if they, if they need to make a decision six days out in, on rail car deployments, then you need to be to, to find a way to, to fill in the gap. And so I think that that's a great potential role for AI in, uh, in helping uh, people understand, okay, well, we don't know exactly, but, but we have some sense from the orders that are uh, available and we also can look at historical trends and things like that and, and, and plug in these variables. And from that, 
um, make a prediction on, uh, on, on what the total rail car uh, requirement will be so they can take this amount of containers off on time. So a really, really good question. Thanks, sorry about that. Maybe, yeah, my reading wasn't great on the fly. Um, so thank you very much, Andrew. This has been really a good uh, lesson for all of us in learning more about the port. And we appreciate you sharing the journey that you continue to go on and learn more about what's happening in the overall shipping industry, because clearly there's variances across all continents and we're happy to be a part of it as well. Deep Sense is involved in a couple of projects. So thank you very much. Thank you for your time and thanks to everyone who listened today. One quick reminder, so next week we also have our next uh, Deep Sense Discovery session with SEUS and they are the Center for Integration Ocean Observation Systems. And that will be fascinating because it's going to be purely about data. While Andrew talked about the applications and the strategic use, we're going to simply learn about what kind of ocean data is out there and how it could be accessed. So thank you very much for your talk today and we'll chat soon. Thanks everyone. Good day.